much, Diana. And thank you everyone here for joining and special thanks to Heather Masood for sharing her amazing work with us all today. Um, I would just like to start also by saying that what we say in today's webinar is not the opinions of the Balfour Project, nor do we speak for them in any sort of way. And um, as uh, Diana very well said, it's part of the Culture Times Conflict series. Now, with this said, this specific webinar would like to highlight um, that the word conflict can become problematic when we're talking about uh, the occupation of settler colonialism, especially when it's illegal under international law. So uh, we wary, we are wary of this uh, linguistic practice and how it can perpetuate um, dynamics of displacement and dispossession. It casts Palestinians as irrational actors against a state with the biggest military in the world. So we don't really think that it's comparable with the word conflict. Now, um, moving on, uh, before we introduce uh, Heather Masood, which is the co-founder of Seitun Products, which are mm, a delicacy, um, we would also like uh, to remember that it's Thanksgiving today, out of coincidence, and uh, to take a moment to remember all the transnational solidarities across Turtle Island and um, Palestine, including um, a plethora of them, like the uh, Dine Solidarity with Palestine group, and uh, just to be aware of the continuities of people fighting against settler colonialisms. And um, another last thing before moving on is um, uh, when we talk about these settler colonialisms, as it was explained on Amber Khan's um, webinar on architecture as part of this series, uh, we are focusing on British colonial accountability, meaning if we trace it back, we can see how Israel is a British colonial project alongside how the US is a European settler colonial project by the British and Canada and Australia. So all of these struggles are connected in some sort of way, even if they try to divide and conquer. Now, Heather, if you'd like to introduce yourself and the amazing work that you, you do as the co-founder of Seitun Products, thank you. Thank you very much, Cecilia, for inviting Zaytoun to join today. We're really happy to be part of this conversation along with our friends, Asama and Isildine. So we are in November, which is a special time of year for us um, because the Palestinian olive harvest is going on. Um, this year has been a good year for olives in Palestine um, due to the climatic conditions. So over the years, for Palestinian farmers, as with farmers the world over, issues of climate change are having an impact, and especially so on small-scale farming. So um, we were delighted to hear about the strong yield that's coming in for farmers this year in Palestine. The olive sector is one that supports up to 100,000 farming families in Palestine. Um, for any of you who've had the, the joy of visiting Palestine, um, you'll know that the olive tree is omnipresent in rural Palestine, beautiful terraces with trees, hundreds, or even um, in some cases, thousands of years old. So these images we're showing here are some of our favorites from previous olive harvests and some from this year as well. Um, these photos mainly come from the Palestine Fair Trade Association and Canaan Fair Trade, with whom we have been sourcing olive oil for many years. Um, so in this high yield year, farmers will be uh, pressing olives to have enough olive oil and olives for their family and creating a surplus also to bring in some income. So um, this sort of delightful product is what you will see many of in uh, Palestinian homes in the cupboards, you know, beautifully pickled, pungent green olives with lemon and chili and gallons of olive oil. Um, the olive is really present in Palestinian culture, in poetry, in art, and of course, in food. Um, so as you can see, the olive harvest brings families together. You've got from children to grandparents, extended families coming in, 
people having some time off university or work to join the olive harvest, which is an extremely labor intensive practice. You know, olives are hand picked in Palestine on family owned farms. Um, this is quite different to the method of cultivation in Europe where more intensive farming practice is used. So the reports we hear of um, over extraction of water from ex uh, intensive farming or um, birds getting caught up in machinery as olives are harvested in, at night in Europe just simply isn't present in Palestine. It's really an example of fantastic environmental stewardship and production of a very high quality olive oil. Whilst there is this joy in Palestine during the olive harvest time, what also comes to the fore is settler violence. Um, within the West Bank in East Jerusalem, there are nearing 700,000 residents in illegal settlements. And settler colonial policies see um, access to water, to land, to infrastructure, really in favor of these illegal settlers. Um, and reports you know, from Amnesty International, from Human Rights Watch and from local NGOs um, outline the, the situation of apartheid that people are living in. So for Palestinian farmers, um, harvesting the olives can also be something where people are, are putting themselves at risk, um, especially in villages that are around some of the more fundamentalist settlements, maybe around Nablus, um, but throughout the West Bank. Um, during this year, there's been numerous reports of settler violence, people being um, attacked in their groves, not being able to access their groves, having fruit stolen, having trees um, burnt or destroyed. And this is happening often in the presence of the military who um, are not intervening to protect the farmers as an occupying power has a responsibility to do. Um, settlers are more often than not armed. Um, we're also hearing some instances where the army are active um, in these violent clashes, supporting settlers over farmers. Um, when we started Zaytun back um, in 2004, um, farmer communities were very active in resisting the route of the wall, which was being built at that time. It was annexing more land, um, separating rural communities from their livelihood, um, separating bits of urban communities from each other. And at that time, we were hearing from farmers that they were meant to be able to access their land through uh, coordination with the military. But in the end, permissions were not being given, gates were not being open, and farmers were not able to access their trees or their olives. Um, those of you who had the, the privilege to join the Palestinian olive harvest may have enjoyed tea cooked over um, an olive twig fire under the groves, generous picnics, um, the dish masachan, which celebrates the, the new harvest oil. And whilst you're enjoying food, you've probably heard the stories of how omnipresent the occupation is in everyday life. Um, for safety within people's homes, within their villages, and within their olive groves and their lands. Um, so these, the photos we're about to see um, after these ones, so this is still with the Palestine Fair Trade Association, um, are in a village called Burin. Um, near Burin is a settlement called Yitzar, which is built on the lands of the village of Burin and also Hawara. And it's known for the, the violence of the settlers who live there. Um, throughout the West Bank, the settlements tend to be taking the hilltops. So these settlements can range in size from an outpost to a city, really. So Yitzar, that started as an outpost, I think some 30 years ago, is now a sizable settlement. Um, Quite near to there, Ariel is, you know, complete with a university um, within its, its walls. This, this transformation from caravans or temporary accommodations to fully fledged towns or cities can only help with centralized government funding and 
really complicity from the international community, because whilst these settlements are illegal, they're growing um, unabated, really. In the UK, their viability is also supported through trade. So we see products from illegal settlements on our shop shelves, um, sometimes of year more so than others. So in the run up to Ramadan, medjool dates are a product that is um, substantially sold within the UK. Consumers are looking more and more at provenance of food. Um, and we're delighted that there has been growth for Palestinian medjool dates during this period. Um, but for consumers, we, we encourage reading the label and understanding where your food comes from and the people behind those products. Um, in the UK also, our current um, Israeli ambassador to the UK um, is a former uh, settler minister in the Israeli government and a strong and vocal advocate for the expansion of settlements and the continuing annexation of Palestinian land. So Zaytun formed uh, in 2004 after visiting Palestine during the olive harvest. So some of these images in Boreen are from this year from people who visited and have brought back the stories of the difficulty of farmers in accessing land and also the joy of food culture in Palestine. And it was that mix that really got under our skin. So when we returned to the UK, um, encouraged our friends and family to purchase Palestinian olive oil and are very proud to have been part of bringing Palestinian produce to UK shop shelves. So this, our flagship product, the Palestinian olive oil, has now been available in the UK for 18 years and we've developed a range of Palestinian food products. Um, grains, maftul and frike, um, almonds, zata, and we've got a few non-food products, uh, nablus soap and Dead Sea Salt. So behind all of these products are farmers who have narratives of food culture and of uh, living within a, a settler colonial uh, setup. So this is Yitzar on the, the peak of the hill that you can see in that photo. Um, so since we have started, we're delighted that Palestinian food is more present in the UK um, through cookbooks, uh, through restaurants, which Asama knows much more about than I. Um, so from Judy Keller's Palestine on a Plate and Leila Haddad's The Gaza Kitchen, Sami Tamimi's recent book, Palestine, have all brought bits of Palestinian cuisine closer to the UK. Um, and we are, we are proud to be part of that. Uh, the new restaurant, soon to be opening in London, Akub from Fadi Katan, who's a, a restauranteur and chef from Bethlehem, has a name that was new to me. So I have never tried Akub, but understand it to be a food that is often foraged in Palestine. And there is legislation that stops Palestinians specifically foraging certain foods such as Akub, Zata. Um, the foragers argue they've been doing this for generations and foraging actually is part of that plant's resilience and health. Um, the plant has never died out, it's always been present. The laws that are stopping them foraging uh, in the guise of environmentalism. Um, so we're very much looking forward to trying uh, this new restaurant in London. So I am um, going to pass, pass over back to you, Cecilia. Thank you so much, Heather, for that. It's very interesting. It's good to um, know the, the back of it and um, how far it stretches and to bring Palestinian products to the UK. Uh, thank you, Osama Kashu, for joining. We uh, Hello. Hello. I did introduce you earlier because I wasn't sure whether you'd be able to make it or not. Thank you so this much. Is, I was running. Thank you. Yeah. I'm so glad you were able to make it. Uh, for Thank those, you very much. For those that don't know you, um, how shall I um, introduce you as an artist, activist? You. I don't know. I'm just a Palestinian, I suppose. 
na bulsi. Ah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, who's uh, who's the, who's speaking next? Is it me or somebody else? Um, I think you asked to go last, but we're still waiting yes. for Uncle Dean and haven't heard back from him. Okay. Hmm. That is good. So what shall we do in the middle? Shall we just try and get some people to interact? Yeah, would I think the interactions we're going to do them at the end, just to, to make sure that we answer the questions that um, we filter through to not waste yeah. any time and to make absolutely. sure there's no conflict between people, you know, in the chat room. And yes, absolutely. Cecilia, I, I, there's a question that I've sent you that is a really interesting one for Heather. So maybe you could do that one while we wait. Perfect. Here. So from Kirsten Dahlberg to all panelists, have you have any record of destroyed olive trees this season, burnt or otherwise destroyed by settlers? I think it's for you, Heather, for Saitun. Does Saitun keep a record of settler violence? So... We have heard um, specifically from this village in Boreen um, because we have been in touch with people who've been um, working as something called protective presence where internationals are accompanying farmers in Palestine um, who have invited some presence during the olive harvest. So we're aware in Boreen that trees have been chopped down, trees have been burnt. Um, through through several people and we we know those numbers but more systematically there are NGOs Palestinian and Israeli and international NGOs such as the UN that do record all the statistics through the year so this year has been one where there's been many reports of settler violence and vandalism of trees and property so Ocha would be one good place to see that and Bet Salem as a more systematic method of recording. More institutionalized, no? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think it's it's an important question because a lot of the times we only get um, uh, Palestinian attention, I think, uh, internationally, when it's uh, a massacre that's being mm -hmm. televised, rather than showcasing the day-to-day -day violence people have to endure, and that it's not just a massacre, it's not just when it gets bombed. It's day to day ongoing violence. So and I think that's it. I think it's those everyday things that affect all of the minutiae of people's lives that is not properly understood and very underreported. So we, we've invited a woman um, from Boreen. Oh, her name is Doha, and we're delighted that she's invited our, accepted our invitation to come to the UK in February, March next year. And we would invite any of the audience here who would like to hear directly from her about her experiences to um, to be in touch with us at Zaytun. She'll be um, of doing some events, um, some supper clubs, some talks, and to understand really what it is like to live under um, a village that's living so close to a, a settlement that has these practices. Um, that go on all year round. Um, it, it peaks at certain times of year, such as the olive harvest, but it's it's every day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to pop in and quickly just say for our London audience um, that we, it's a bit naughty of me because it's for talking about another charity that I work with, but those of you that are in London on the 5th of December, Monday, 5th of December, St. John Eye Hospital is having a fair at the um, Chelsea Old Town Hall, and I'm really excited to say that Zaytun will be there with all of their produce. Um, I'm excited because I could do with some Dead Sea, some ethical Dead Sea salt, so if you do that, <laughs> put one aside for me. Um, so if you are in London, then please, please do um, pop along and um, do some shopping and find Heather and her team there with all of their produce. And you've got a question about uh, from Gladys about the lady's name, the one that's coming next year. Doha Asus. So we, we would be happy to share information with her. People want to be in touch and these are pending, let you know where she'll be speaking. Amazing. And just so that everyone knows all of these uh, resources and um, sites that we're mentioning, it's all going to be compiled in a document at the end that we'll share in a PowerPoint. And I see Sildeen. 
Hello, Isolde. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Ahlan wa sahlan. Happy to be here with you guys. Great to see you. Amazing. Ahlan, Sir Salveen. Salamat, salamat. You hear me well? The connection is good? Yes. Beautiful. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, I'm very happy to catch up with you. Sorry, uh, it's a busy day, uh, but I'm very happy to be over here uh, with you all. Uh, I hope uh, it's been going well one day so far. Thank you so much for making the time for this and especially BC Day. It's been going well so far. Just to catch you up, Heather Masood has spoken about the work of Seitun products in bringing Palestine to the UK. And um, uh, we were waiting for you to share what you wish. And then um, Osama can end the webinar. Yeah, I can delete everything. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, ma'am, to ma'am. Uh, well, uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here connected uh, with you guys from uh, Jerusalem, Palestine. And uh, I would like to tell you a bit about uh, sacred cuisine and what's uh, the main aspect of sacred cuisine. Um, so basically, sacred cuisine as a company, as an as an initiative, it's focusing on telling the Palestinian uh, vegetarian or vegan uh, story. In our food, we have something that we refer to as a vegan food, the fasting food. And when we refer to the fasting food, we are referring to the food of suitable for the Lent, the Christian fasting. This practice of uh, Christian fasting it brought so many dishes to the uh, Middle Eastern and the Palestinian table. Most of them, most famous one of them is the falafel. Uh, so me personally being Palestinian, being a foodie, uh, love to cook uh, and uh, getting to see the trend of today word and what people focusing on and see everybody is uh, talking about the vegan food and uh, looking and uh, adapting to this trend. Uh, what I found fascinating is like in our culture, we have this principle thousands of years old. Uh, and this concept in itself, it was mind blowing for me. So I decided to focus my company on telling exactly what the Somi food, what the Somi culture and such. Uh, and from there, it's basically, I take, uh, the bride uh, and uh, also the opportunity to share the Palestinian cuisine uh, with the world because it is really rich of uh, customs, culture, delicious food, and very uh, spiritual and also healthy approach, uh, which today is missing uh, from our diet or from our way of how we uh, uh, consume food and how we eat. Uh, so this is uh, me personally focusing on this aspect of food culture and food history. Uh, I found many ways that I can connect with the people worldwide and I can share them, with them these values and traditions. Do you hear me, guys? That's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you for sharing. I like um, also the aspect of that, that it goes to show how for so many years before the nation state was imposed in the region, so many religions and cultures coexisted in, in Palestine. So thank you, thank you so much. Uh, yes, my pleasure. And uh, you know, this is, this is another aspect is like, uh, there is so many dishes that we eat, uh, but if we think about it as, What's the story behind these dishes and what's the idea behind these dishes? Uh, we come to find even more rich and more interesting and what even make the dish even taste much better. So it's like when I found the story of falafel, I found the story of maklouba, msakhan, just like every time I'm eating the dish, I'm thinking about the story and it's like so much meaningful. And uh, not just the Palestinian food, of course, and not just the Middle Eastern food, but uh, if we look at our history in food, uh, there is so much interesting and actually can bring us closer to our ancestors, to the land, uh, to the natural flow of uh, life. Uh, and uh, what's, uh, what is fascinating, especially in ancient uh, uh, cultures, 
uh, for example, they try to convince us that right now we're being modern and right now we're being advanced as a civilization. But for me, when I look at Asian civilization, uh, such as uh, the indigenous people of United States of America, the Native American, or many people around the world, uh, different culture, we always find they had uh, a bride and they had uh, a style and they had their own clothes, they had their own recipe, their own customs and how much of this culture and history, it was harmonious and it was entwining with everything and it was eco-friendly and it was uh, natural uh, and uh, it has a, a bright, a grace, a beauty and yet very deep meaning uh, uh, behind uh, these habits and culture. So uh, for food, for me, kind of wake up this, uh, this side of like to look into history in different aspects. Uh, and I'm so, so thankful for you know, the Palestinian food. Uh, and it took me uh, to go to live in the United States of America to discover my passion for cooking and to realize that I'm missing the Palestinian food and culture. And from there, it brought me even closer to Palestine and uh, nature also uh, and such. That's beautiful, Isildin. Thank you. I really, really liked what you said there in how all, all this life is trapped by these ideas of modernity mm. and progress and linear time, as if that was a thing of the past, when they trap it in the past so that they can seem as uncivilized, as if the past existed or is a thing, as if time was linear, when um, past, present, future, it's all the now, it's yeah, I really uh, liked what you think, what you said. Thank you, Thank you. for sharing. Absolutely. I don't know uh, how much time I have to speak, uh, or is it... Uh, uh... I think we have half an hour more for discussion. Os Osama still needs to speak, but I think it's um, it'd be great for us to share whatever comes. I mean, yeah. uh, it's a beautiful story. One, one last thing I would like to add, uh, and after this, I will give uh, the opportunity to Sama. Uh, it's uh, what really, uh, it, it hit me over here in Palestine very hard, and I am still finding a way how I can uh, find peace in it in my heart uh, and such. Uh, it is a uh, political situation, of course, that's happened in, in the country, in Palestine. Uh, and uh, for outsiders, for from who is not in Palestine uh, or uh, in, in the conflict, um, a lot of people think that there is the politician people who are fighting and arguing in this, and there is other people who are not part of this. Uh, and the politician, they can fight, the people who want to fight can they fight, the people who want to do war, they can do war. Uh, but uh, actually here, reality in Palestine is like... Um, many people who it does not matter if you're a politician if you are literature if you are a farmer or even if you are a chef uh, this life uh, of occupation have it shows you and it can be obstacle and it can affect your life uh, so i understand politician who want to be politician but uh, the thing i cannot understand is uh, for example the palestinian farmers who are trying just to do their work as farmers, they're trying to just harvest their trees, trying to plant uh, and the brutality they get for them being in their land, for them harvesting their uh, olive. I'm sure Heather uh, probably uh, from Zaytuna, she know much about this a lot because she worked with some of these farmers and maybe you mentioned already something about it, uh, but uh, these farmers in Palestine, you don't understand how these farmers, by trying just to be farmers, by not to trying to be with a politician or activist or anything, they're trying just to harvest their olives. They're trying just to plant uh, uh, their trees. Most of these farmers face brutality and face so much violence from the settlers, the system, the uh, police, the military. And this is where uh, in, in Palestine, it is not important what you are. If you are here Palestinian and you are connected 
to your land. You are working with your land. You are facing uh, a lot of uh, hostility. It's just because the idea they try to disconnect us from the land. And when you are disconnected from disconnected from your land, you don't know how to do the ingredient that's go up in the land. You don't know how to do with it. But culture is actually how these uh, indigenous people find a way to utilize uh, these uh, produce uh, and such. Uh, so uh, I, for all the listeners, uh, for everybody who's here with us, uh, if you can support uh, Palestinian uh, farmers, if you can support Palestinian product, that will mean so much and it will continue to support these people just for them to make a living and to continue on what they do. That's the last thing. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity and uh, for allowing me to be part of this. Thank you so much, Isildin. Amazing, thank you. Uh, sorry, Osama, quickly, is there's a quick, um, before we move on to you, uh, Rosemary Nash was asking, please tell us the story of falafels, Isildin. The story of falafel, uh, the Coptic Christian of uh, Egypt, which is a Christian sect in Egypt, they called the Coptic. Uh, they are the one who came up with the idea uh, of making falafel because they wanted something full of protein, something delicious and fast to sustain them in the 40 days of the Lent fasting. And uh, that's why if you go to Egypt today and you try the falafel, it will be made out of fava bean, not the chickpeas, but wherever you go around the world, you try falafel for most of the time, it will be made with the chickpeas. It's because the Egyptian, when they start to make the falafel, they started with the fava bean and they continue to use the fava bean. We took it and we modified it to the chickpeas and it became uh, more of a famous version. But the origin of falafel is made of fava bean and the Coptic of Egypt, Egyptian, basically it brought this wonderful thing to our table. Wow. Thank you, Isaldin. Okay, and finally, Osama, are you ready? Finally, Osama. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's uh, so 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 nice to see Heather after all these years. I, I don't know exactly why we don't meet in London, but we should. And Selvin, thank you very much. A beautiful story. Uh, okay, so I'm not going to be very, 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 very simple, but I'm going to uh, be a little bit thoughtful. We have a saying in Palestine, uh, which goes like, th there isn't exact translation in English, but it says in Arabic, and it's it's our famous uh, saying like there's a, there's a very famous Basil uh, Araj, uh, one of the most dominant Palestinian intellectual who was assassinated a few years back. Uh, he came up with this uh, slogan, which is which basically says um, live like an occupine and fight like a flea or like a fungus or like a um, a culture. And I'm not talking about the culture, which is basically that everybody we're talking about, but culture is something that I'm going to relate to because I'm a filmmaker and um, I have a, it's been a reflecting on all of these stories. You know, when we started the ISM movement in Palestine, me and a couple of friends, it was just a crazy idea of trying to attract some people to come on a political tourism to Palestine to help with the checkpoints. And out of that, the idea of olive harvest was born. And I think I, I've met a few people like Heather and Catherine, I don't remember all the names. And I was one of those Palestinian activists on the ground. I never thought of leaving Palestine, but somehow I've managed to find my way into the UK and eventually studying filmmaking because I want to communicate culture. And um, yeah, I received a phone call from Atif, one of, one of the friends that I've met in Palestine and maybe Heather was with him and what. Whatever. And they said, like, would you like to show your film? Uh, because we started this uh, Zaytun project and we want to promote uh, olive harvest and olive, uh, you know, uh, olive oil in, in, in London. And, and I was like, what? It's crazy how these things kind of start merging each other. So the, the idea of cultural product, which is mainly films and painting and dance and all of these things, was my, my, uh, my interest as something that you can communicate and you can take with you everywhere. Because we in Palestine are being denied um, to tell our own story, to tell our own narrative. So there's a little bit of a noise. I don't know exactly if, I, if somebody can help me by muting the mic because I'm just hearing a lot of background noise. 
Um, but we have been denied from telling our own story and our own narrative. And filmmaking and media and stories and culture is another way of communicating us. And as you know, culture is very important for the resistance, is very important for the continuity of the generation. And the actual word of culture, what does culture mean? Culture means life lives inside life. So the culture is basically is the life that live in the life that live in the life. And if you take the actual word of culture, where we use in the lab, it's the fungus, is that kind of little cr creature that we culture in the lab. So for me, I don't, well, for me, my philosophy that Palestinian culture will never die because our cuisine is that fungus that is hard to beat. We're not a huge, we're not the goo, we're not the big animal. We're just little fungus that are gonna survive forever. It's gonna basically, it's gonna basically survive all the odds and it will continue thriving. It's like that yeast that will always thrive. I remember my mom, God bless her soul, when she, it's crazy that I'm discovering this now, but when she was making bread in our little village, when we were under siege, that bread was a continuation of my grandmother bread. And my grandmother bread was a continuation of my great grandmother bread. So my mom actually was making bread in our home, which is 300 years old, if not more, because that little piece of bread that was inherited because the generation that make the yeast of the bread that my mom was making is 300 years old. This is the, when we come to, to, to London and we see this sourdough bread and the culture that make the sourdough bread and it's kind of like, it's, it's actually what makes the sourdough more interesting is that uh, how old it is, you know? In Palestine, we talk in hundreds, maybe in thousands of years. You name the, the yogurt, the kefir, the, the uh, yeast, uh, everything. So we are, we bury our culture within our food, within our dance, within our own. Um, that's how we tell story. That's how we communicate stories. So for me, as a storyteller, as a filmmaker, where I used to make films, and unfortunately, <laughs> there isn't a lot of money, and you need to live in London, and somehow you need to communicate, and you know, films is, is, is a very, very hard thing to master. And by the way, I don't know if people um, on this, on this uh, webinar know that um, there is uh, the, my, my first film that I've made in the UK called My Dear Olive Tree. I don't know whether people can watch the length of that film, which communicate clearly the, the cruelty. Uh, I don't know that you can bring some of that link into the, the audience, but it, 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 it's a very, very true reflection of how Israel are going deep into the hearts and minds of the Palestinian people to defeat them by killing that love to the olive tree and by uprooting these olive trees. And it's crazy. So um, these kind of films that I was making, unfortunately, you share it amongst your friends and, you know, the the support that you have and maybe the left wing activists and you know you're reaching to the converters basically so it's not it wasn't really my satisfaction and you don't make money because if you make if you communicate to your your culture and your politically uh, you know that side and your name is osama obviously the chances of you making like a i don't know like a blockbuster films is pretty slim so i thought maybe let me cross over to falafels and i can find another culture through the falafel to communicate. And I know everybody's eating here and there. So let me try and communicate to people. And I gave up the idea of trying to, to change the world because I was on a mission to change the whole world. Um, and then I realized, you know what? I actually want to change 40,000 people and that's it. Um, you know, my job is done. So I, I've kind of like gave up the idea of changing everybody. I just want to change 40,000. And maybe perhaps within these 40,000, another 40,000 could be born. But I just wanted to be a little fungus, just a little fungus, and focus my attention on that culture, which is not the, the film culture, but the actual fungus culture, where we can create something that's going to live for a long time. And that's when the idea of uh, making a restaurant in London start bubbling. It's not easy, you know, um, it was an easy journey. I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not, a, I am not intellectual. I'm not, I don't claim to be uh, like Abby Schleim or like Sami Tamimi or all of these kind of like guys who write about food and like, I, I, I don't, I don't like cooking. Um, 
I like eating uh, pretty much. I'm not a restaurateur. I don't think that is a good definition of myself. But I wanted to create a successful business model where we can use that space as a permanent hub where people can go and eat and talk and, uh, and um, you know, I could communicate Palestine. And I wanted to enforce the actual Palestinian brand cuisine in London. Um, and when I, when, when I decided to change the, 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 the brand of my uh, restaurant from Lebanese to Palestinian, I had a huge, huge um, uh, conflict and problems with it. With a, with, a, with, a, with a Jewish chronicle and, um, you know, the people accusing me of being anti-Semite and, you know, just boycotts that started happening against my, my, my places. And um, immediately another counter movement started to support this, this, uh, this movement, especially that we had next to us, they were like a, a, an Israeli restaurant selling just hummus and their slogan was give chick bees a chance. You know what I mean? So I I thought maybe give me a chance and I opened the restaurant and luckily a few years later they went you know bankrupt and we're still surviving because we communicate the true story the true hummus the true basically uh, food and um, that for me was a little kind of like uh, uh, my little uh, my little achievement in in in, in Holborn and uh, hopefully now we have few branches and I don't know exactly. Um, how can we communicate the Palestinian food brand on a wider audience? But since we started, I'm so happy that I can see a lot of, a lot of restaurants, which now proudly call themselves Palestinian restaurants, which is great, which is great, which is wonderful. Um, before we, we, we used to hide behind the Lebanese and Turkish brand um, as Palestinian refugees, because we don't want to lose the, you know, the, the, the trade. And that was crazy. So um, yes, it was a very good move. And I'm very, very glad that now the Palestinian cuisine is mushrooming and it's actually going and taking off on different levels. And it's actually great. Um, um, and I think people appreciate it. So now we're introducing, um, I'm not gonna, it's not, it's, not a, it's, not, it's not a marketing to my restaurant, but I think we are introducing to the world, the kunafa, the zahtar, the, um, the uh, new products that we create out of the Palestinian cuisine. But for example, if you mix extra virgin olive oil with zatar, there's a product there which we use for manakish, and we're going to have that. And that lasts for 10 years. You know, there's no like expiry date on that one. And we're going to try and reach out the shelf markets and hopefully get it there. And within that, we will be able to uh, communicate Palestine through the zatar and olive oil. There is also other stories um, in Andalusia, in Spain, there is a Palestinian family called Jubara family. And this Jubara family, they used to be part of uh, the Andalusia, um, you know, uh, during the Islamic presence in, uh, in, in Spain and Andalusia. They and didn't like the Spanish uh, <laughs> olive oil. So what they did, this Palestinian tribe, they brought within from the Jubara village um, the olive trees and they planted it in Spain. And now there is a huge area in Spain where it's just planted with the Palestinian olive trees. And um, so we we bring the olive uh, olive oil from uh, I say we a friend of mine could believe he brings it but but we we actually tell the story that this is the this is the land where the olives in there been planted by a Palestinian tribe who still basically they are still living in, um, in Spain and they brought with them their olive tree and now they are producing olive oil it's not very much but it's a little bit so it's a great story um, there's another story about the. Uh, the olive oil in Palestine because of the, um, I don't know, Heather can tell us more about this, but we are trying to create a, a refinery in Jordan where we can blend olive oil from different parts of the world with the Palestinian olive oil and state it clearly. So we're just almost going to make a marriage between different olive oil and the Palestinian olive oil and market it. So we make solidarity. It's like, I don't know how you put it, um, twinnings between, <laughs> between countries to the olive oil because we don't have a lot of olive oil in Palestine. So we... Um, we are thinking of maybe doing a, uh, I don't know, just mix like you know when you, it's like a coffee, you know, a blend, a blend of olive oil from um, say Algeria, Jordan, and Palestine, maybe uh, Italy and Palestine, maybe Spain, and but I don't know, 
And I think it's really interesting. I just want to inject it. You know, I want to inject Palestine and everything. I want to infuse things with Palestine and the flavor and try and reach out, you know, because we need to kind of talk money. We need to talk about, um, about uh, the injustice. We need to talk, to talk about uh, the uh, occupation. We need, but we need to communicate all of these things food wise. And, you know, once you talk to the tummy, then you are listening. And I think people appreciate that there is a stories behind every single cuisine, like the falafel. The falafel, I think there's a lot of stories about what is the falafel and how the falafel came about. And I think there is a famous story in Akka where the Ottoman used to take the harvest and leave the farm, and the farmers basically have to give up everything to the Ottoman soldiers. So when the Ottoman soldiers arrive, they usually crush their chickpeas uh, a little bit and they say like, look, this is a broken chickpeas. Why you don't need it? Just take the good one and leave the broken one. And then out of that broken one, the hummus and the falafel, they, they have to start making things out of it, which basically, you know, become the, 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 these kind of uh, dishes. And, uh, uh, and here we talk about flavors, not food, because food, I don't, you know, sometimes it's hard to claim food and the originality of food, but flavors are seasonal and regional. So for example, rice and, rice and um, lentils. Yeah, rice and lentils, um, it's, uh, you find it in Africa, you find it in Latin America, you find it in Palestine, you find it everywhere. But the, the, what, what make this different from that um, is basically the flavor. So I think, I think there, is a great, um, there is a great definition that, that, that is produced because of food to culture. And I'm talking about actual behavior culture and actual food culture and stories, which is which is which is beautiful. And I think um, I'm going to go back to my first point. Once we focus the cultural aspect of our resistance to the basic idea of being a fungus, which is very hard to be defeated, that is amazing. So if somebody is going to ask me, "What are you trying to do? What is your legacy? Why are you trying to leave behind you?" I would say I'm going to try and leave behind me a little fungus, which is hard to defeat, which is going to infect other people. And this infectious fungus would survive forever because it is culture, which have a lot of culture in it. And it's going to be there forever. And I think 70 years on, Israel still to, to try more to try and control and, um, you know, create the new indigenous and the new Aboriginals in the Middle East. We refuse to disappear because our culture is deeply rooted beyond the earth. It's going further. And it's not, it's no secret. They, they are trying using money, using power, using army, whatever. And it's not about basically the defeat that they are, they are, they are causing or so-called defeat by using their big machines and guns and all of that things, the actual victory they're looking for, it's never going to be there, simply because the justice and the fungus are actually there to stay forever. And nobody can hide the sun with a net. If you are crazy enough, you can't see the sun shining behind the olive trees. And if you go to Palestine and you look at these settlements that Heather was showing us before, and you look at the Palestinian villages, you see that these settlements are just on the surface, <coughs> while the Palestinian villages and cities and houses are entrenched and rooted, and they are literally marinated with the actual earth and stones, and nobody can deny that. So I don't know whether that was a useful contribution, but I think we all uh in this fight together and we need to kind of like push on all fronts to get to that position where justice have to prevail and hopefully Palestine will be free at some point <coughs> sorry i don't know that was clear or i was just saying to myself it was no it was beautifully clear great that was so very inspiring and also very on theme of what we were saying earlier, you know, of challenging all of these institutions and current um, uh, systems of what we can, when yeah. they have seen this fungus that you very well said in Palestine and across all of the grassroots transnational solidarities that Palestine has inspired and led and shared yeah. with in colonialism. So yes, it's a fungus that's most of the earth, 
even if we get this one narrative of this is history, this is reality, this is culture, when it's yeah, what you said, that's always going to be there. That the fungus is always going yeah. to be there. true. Beautiful, Osama. Thank you so much, and thank you, Heather, so much, and thank you, Isolding, so so much for sharing the beautiful life today through food. Um, I'm popping back, even though I'm the tech guy on this webinar, because I actually have a question for Isildine. Um, As a yes. uh, vegetarian Palestinian from Jerusalem, uh, and you mentioned vegetarian and vegan food, um, I've noticed it's got easier being vegetarian, but I just wondered, because you know what, I just, I've been vegetarian a long time, and every time I go over there, no matter how high my, because there's so much vegetarian options in Palestinian cuisine, but it didn't matter how high up, how, how much food I had piled on my plate. If there wasn't like a big lamb on top, people would be like, aren't you hungry? Don't you want to eat? And I would say, I'm vegetarian. And they say, okay, never mind, have the chicken or the fish. And it's like, no, um, that's not what I mean. So I just wondered if you could tell us if if the attitude towards being vegetarian or vegan has changed. Um, because again, it's never been about the availability of options. It's been more difficult trying to explain. The, the reasoning behind being vegetarian quite often I would tell people it was for medical reasons just because that they would understand that and yeah so I just wondered if you had any thoughts on how that's changing is it changing is it getting easier to be vegetarian and vegan traveling in the region to be honest with you I think it is becoming uh, we as a people worldwide uh, we were vegetarian much more and nobody could afford to eat meat to this level on all kind of level, on all kind of places, all kind of countries. I think uh, there was a switch that's happened when uh, my father, for example, he will eat meat a few times a week. And when he had the opportunity to provide meat every day for his family, he felt that he is providing better. This idea, it's worldwide concept. And I think all families uh, kind of having the ability and afford to buy meat, this is what made meat very primarily. Uh, and recently, in the last 100 years, to take uh, the middle spot uh, of the table. But uh, I always say it, Palestinian food and hospitality is one coin. It is not the food and it's not hospitality. Both of them are very, very, very entwined. What that mean? That mean when you come to someone feed you, it's have to be abundance. People have to make sure you have a different option. People have to make sure that uh, they cook you a lot of food and it's coming all out of hospitality. Uh, and uh, when people are uh, trying to feed you, uh, they just want to nutrient you uh, without paying attention to your diet because in, uh, in a place like Palestine and other places less fortunate, Sometimes this thing cannot be even an option, you know, uh, to be vegetarian or such. Uh, sometimes people uh, just like they have whatever they had, especially before in the era of Intifada and such, there was so many closure, people cannot leave their home and things. And this is where dips and atheine were very popular and zatar and olive oil were very popular because family survived on this. Uh, so it is... Uh, When they are trying to give you food, uh, they want you to be fed. And in the, the understanding right now, it is like meat. It will make you full. It will give you nutrients. It will give you protein and such. And I would say, uh, I, I think the best way to say that you are allergic than saying you are vegetarian, because to try to convince uh, the people that uh, vegetarian is the way, it's uh, kind of a bit of uh, something they cannot understand. Uh, they cannot comprehend. And uh, I think it is also dropping this level of uh, people feel, you know, you are not uh, trying to be better than them or you are different than them uh, in any way. And uh, this, uh, this thing can help you to connect with the people more and for people to understand you. And it's to be, to, for you to believe me, it is the easiest way to get out of eaten meat or anything you don't just say medical reasons allergic and khalas 
you know, you're trying to, con to convince you to eat meat. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, to be honest with you, uh, one of the things that I encounter a lot in, in my career and uh, somehow I, uh, I, I don't know how to put it out. Israel is the first vegan army in the world. What that mean? Does not even make sense. Does not like fit, you know. And I think uh, this is a trend, uh, and I think uh, this this approach is uh, is kind of taking this thing and make it more commercial, uh, in a way. Uh, and especially in in uh, places where food is uh, it's a matter of uh, some people not having access to it or not enough. Uh, it's hard for them to to comprehend uh, this. So that's why I think the SOMI concept, it's a brilliant. Uh, SOMI concept, it's very practical. SOMI concept, it's a big invitation to invite everyone to be like, hey, you can eat whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. But sometimes it's nice to kind of cleanse yourself, to pay attention, to get connected with people. And that's why we have Ramadan as a fasting month. That's why the Lent came to life is uh, to kind of like uh, allow the people to participate uh, in, uh, in this process of sometimes it's okay to disconnect it from what you like and to uh, connect with the people who are less fortunate uh, and such. And I think uh, the SOMI uh, concept, it can be applied into two in too many different ways, not just as far as diet. It can be like, uh, doing a practice of not using plastic for one month which is can be impossible uh and uh, this uh, this approach of somi i think it's very beautiful approach is still involve everyone to kind of improve themselves in the same time not to be under a certain title i'm a vegetarian vegan gluten free or such Thank you. Sorry, I was just uh, jumping in to ask my question. Osama, before I go, I just wanted to say you mentioned Avi Schleim. He's actually watching today. So hello, Avi. Thank you for joining us again. Um, Cecilia, I'll hand over to you now for the Q&A. Well, thank you so much, uh, everyone again and everyone watching, of course. And um, also a special thanks uh, to Sayeda from Hiba for getting me in contact with Osama. She was a vital person in getting this webinar going. And now we'll finalize with the questions from the speakers. So, um, from Irene Abugatas from Peru. I am Palestinian Peruvian. One question. Is there a book about Palestinian Arab food you can recommend us? I think it might be for Isaldin, but I, any of you please reply if you can think of it. Uh, Gaz and Kitchen, I highly recommend it. And also Palestine on a Plate, uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, and uh, of course, there is many other uh, books, but uh, these are my favorites. I think also, just for, um, just very quickly, um, there is, um, I don't know, I can share with you some link, but there is also something called Pop Palestine. It's very, very nice. Very good. Spanish, right? Uh... Yeah, it's Italian, Spanish. Italian. Pop Palestine, P O P Palestine. I can put it in my chat. Yeah. It's very, very easy recipe. It's very beautiful. It's two minutes and you can make any Palestinian dish. And it's made by these two beautiful friends of mine, and they're just crazy and great. And um, there is a book as well, which is, comes with it, but it's um, it's it's also on YouTube. You can you can watch it and it's just lovely. And very easy and very simple and no no complication just like straight to the point no, yes no. that's it cecilia thank you osama well as think if we don't have any other questions well from jackie hillary he said participants might like to hear leon russelson's song the olive tree there is a beautiful version online sung by janet russell mm -hmm. Right, so I'm gonna pop back to um, thank you all so much for coming along and speaking and thank you everyone in the audience for listening. Um, it's been so interesting hearing all, what you all had to say. I've popped links in the um, chat box throughout, but all of the links can be found on the website. This um, page about this event will appear in our past recording. So we will have the recording up there. We have a fantastic resource that Celia put together with loads of links that she had mentioned and some of the other speakers have mentioned. And um, also we have an upcoming event on the 7th of December about Palestinian Christians. 
with uh, Reverend Dr. Reverend Munther Isaac. Those of you um, may remember, some of you may remember, he spoke last year about Christian Zionism and it was really, really interesting. So we're really happy to have him back again. So that's the 7th of December. So please do join us. And um, yeah, if you enjoyed this talk, we are a charity. We offer these webinars for free. I'm gonna post some links in the chat box where you can support our work. We are always, always, always in need of um, some money so that we can carry on with this education through webinars on different topics. And um, in particular, we're looking for friends. To become a friend of the Balfour Project, you just need to sign up for regular giving of any amount per month or annually, whichever you prefer. And I'll pop the link in the chat box. We do offer um, benefits if you become a friend. So for example, we've had a couple of film screenings recently from um, Dora Moray. Um, and the Just Vision uh, boycott film, which was so fascinating. And if you become a friend, then you can get tickets to those for free, whereas otherwise you have to pay. Um, usually they are about £10. And um, so I've popped the link in the chat box. Please do consider becoming a friend of the Balfour Project. We will be very, very grateful. And uh, yeah, that just leaves me to thank Cecilia for organizing this wonderful webinar. Thank our speakers as well. Mm -hmm. You've been so great. Thank you for joining us. I know the time difference and your busy schedules has made it difficult. So we really appreciate you joining us. And we would love to thank everyone for coming along. Avi Schleim and the team for coming along and listening to us today. Um, it's been fantastic and we really appreciate all of you. So thank you so much. Thank and you again, you. Heather. Thank you. thank you to you all. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. I'm yes. so feeling hungry now. I need to go yeah. feast on some Palestinian food. <laughs> I'll go and eat some olives <laughs> now. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Best wishes. Have a we'll lovely evening. Either yeah, we'll connect. I'm gonna just get you into the. Sounds good. Into the Great pool. To see you all. <laughs>